Thank you so much. Thank everybody here. Hallelujah. Is that going to be opening light? Praise God. Hallelujah. It's my daughter, Shelly. Who can preach anything I preach, teach anything I teach better even. It's truth. It's truth. Um, you know, the Bible says that uh, we should, he will provide all sufficiency in every good work. So God speaks of good works. And I sense, pastors, that this is a good work. This is a very good work. I can tell it in many ways. My spirit. It's just a good work. And I just thank God for your faithfulness and continuing this good work and until he comes. Hallelujah. And that you will have all sufficiency. Uh, you know, uh, one thing I enjoy here, too, is the worship. The, uh, and this morning, all the morning he's been downloading in me. And this morning, uh, I was sitting there, and you sang a song, and it had a line in it that we didn't sing over and over like some of it, but there was a line that we sang, I think, twice. And it said, I am here for you. We are here for you. We are here for you. And I thought, that's the meaning of life. People are seeking the meaning of life. And they say, what am I here for? For you. We're here for you. I'm on earth for you. I'm in Gosford for you. So just like you, ha she had you put your hand on your heart, just say that, I am here for you. I am here for you. You could go home now. That's a message. <laughs> but I'm not going to let you. Uh, please be seated. Hallelujah. And uh, I got up this morning at really early. And uh, the Lord was talking to me again about what he wants. And... Uh, my dad would often say that when Billy preaches, you need to bring a peanut butter sandwich. And Shelly said, are we going to have to take Pawpaw's advice this morning? And I said, no, I don't even think I could possibly finish with what I heard today. But we'll just go as far as we can, and then I'll stop, and we'll come back tonight. I'm glad we have more than one service. A lot of times people these days don't want you but one service. I don't know how it is here, but that's how it is states so thank god we got a bible school 3bi billy brim bible institute i just teach and teach and teach and teach and it's good but um the lord wants me to talk to you again about time time and um i think about time when i come to australia uh the first time this is my 11th time to get to visit here it's a blessing how we do love the Aussies. Oh, my goodness. The Kiwis and all the people around here, this area. But on my first journey back, well, when I was here the first time, uh, I have a grandson, Jared. You might see him if you ever watch our, our live broadcast. Sometimes he's on. And uh, he was a little kid then. He was real inquisitive. And um, he could ask a jillion questions, just a jillion questions. And one time, we live in Branson, Missouri. You need to Google it. And it's a gorgeous place in the Ozark Mountains. There we have 300 acres where we have a prayer center and a ministry. And uh, we, have, it's, uh, we have more theater seats than Broadway. We have a lot of music. We have a lot of entertainment. We have um, lakes and streams and rivers and mountains. And it's called the Ozarks. And uh, we have what you call Ozark Christmas. And we have Christmas at the right time of year. And uh, you put the lights all out, and we have, oh. So one night he was driving with Shelly, his Aunt Shelly, I think, to a basketball game, and he said, he was asking her questions after questions after questions, and she's getting a little tired of it. She was driving to another town. He said, how many Christmas lights do you think we have in Branson from this point to that point? And she said, Jared, shut up. 
<laughs> I'm trying to find my way to the next town. It was before GPS. And uh, he said, well, I only had one more. Okay, one more. He said, what about those black holes in space? That's it. So I was here, and I called my daughter Brenda, his mother, and Jared answered the phone. I thought, I'm going to fix her up. I'm going to give him some questions. I said, um, hello, Jared, this is Mimi. I'm calling you from tomorrow. I said, don't be concerned about yesterday. It turned out all right. And when I was flying back that time, uh, you, can, you, know, you can leave Sydney and land in Los Angeles before you left Sydney. And we crossed the international date line. It's the only time in all the 11 trips. And the pilot said, we have just crossed the international date line. And then I heard the voice of God. And it said this, the voice. God invented time precisely Mathematically, scientifically, God measured out a piece of eternity and called it time for his dealings with man. Each passing second counts off time until the end of time and its usefulness to God. God, we are told, lives in eternity. He doesn't need time. The only reason for time is to fix the fall of man. Do you have that chart of uh, years that we showed last night? Bless the Lord. It's number one on my... There it was. I saw it. <laughs> it ran away. But that was it. There you go. Um, this is time. This is the measured out time. And we know this from uh, the Talmud, which was the oral law. This was told to Moses when he went up on the 40 days and 40 nights with God more than once. And the Lord told him that he gave to Adam a six-day work week. Just like God worked six days and then he rested on the seventh. He said to Adam, here's a work week. Let's see what you can do with it. And he was the God of this world, Adam. And he had been given uh, dominion. We know that he sold out to the devil. But he had the right to do so. Not the moral right, but the legal right. He sold out to the devil. So for Adam's lease, and each day is a thousand years, for Adam's lease, uh, Satan moved into the heavenlies. Over this world, like a double kingdom system, he's called the prince of the power of the air. He's called the god of this world. He moved in there, and he will be there until Adam's lease is up. There's a moed. There's nothing you can do to change that moed. People think you can, but you can't. You can't be good enough to change it. The church can't get glorious enough to change it. It's a set date. It's a date that Adam's lease is, is up. God did everything on moeds. Moeds are fixed times. Jesus was the Passover lamb. He came on a moed. The Holy Ghost came on a moed. He came on the date, which was the um, Pentecost. We call it Shavuot. And there's a day for Jesus coming. There was a day, time for him to come the first time. In the fullness of time, he came. Time is important. And times, there are fixed times. All of this time, in, in these 6,000 years... There are ages and dispensations, and God is doing something in each of these times. You live on the earth in one of those times. You don't live in the time of Noah's flood. If you had, you should get you a hammer, help with the ark. You don't live in the time when Jesus walked the earth the first time. If you did, you should make some loaves and fishes and go to the meeting. But you live now. There are two golden hooks upon which all history hangs, said Sister Wilkerson. The first coming of the Lord and the second coming of the Lord. All other events pale in the light of those two. And we're right up against 
the second coming of the Lord. And God's doing something. And he, he's doing it in you. He's doing it in the church. He wants to. I came here the first time and I shared about it last night. Because David Duplessy had pinned me to the wall and told me about the time that Smith Wigglesworth pinned him to the wall after having come back from New Zealand and, and uh, Australia about the great final move of God and that Australia would play a big part in that. And so I came my first time looking, looking. I remember I left here. I went to Singapore and I told the Caminettis. I don't know if you know the Caminettis. I took those Caminettis almost by the lapel. I said, leave Singapore and go to Australia. <laughs> because there's going to be great happenings. Now, the Lord sent me here this time to tell you it's time. You've been looking for it. You've heard about it. Maybe you want to stop hearing about it. But you're not supposed to despise prophesyings. There will come a time. Jesus was prophesied his first coming thousands of years. And now his second coming. But it's going to be. You could be just as sure of it. And you can be just as sure there's going to be a great final move of God. Just like Smith Wigglesworth said. Now, Shelly, I want you to come up here. And I want you to. This was Smith Wigglesworth's theme song. Or you can sing it from down there. It doesn't matter. But this was his theme song, and what he sang about, he let God do to him. And that's why God was able to do miracles, and so much through Smith Wigglesworth, we still talk about him. Because he knew the validity of this truth. So shall he stand up and lead them in that song? Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, do you have your Bibles? I do too. It's a little worn, but it's the one God speaks to me. You, do you have your favorite? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. So Smith Wigglesworth, he would stand. He would place his Bible on his head. On his head. Let's, let's do this. <laughs> Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. I guess if you have a telephone, you just got to put it up there on your head. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> this is God's word. It's his voice to me. I am what his word says I am. I can do what his word says I can do. It is the incorruptible seed of the living God. Planted in my heart that brings great fruit, all for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? So he would put, Smith Wigglesworth would put his Bible on his head and say and sing with a big booming voice. But I don't have one, so we'll just have to pretend here, okay? But you can imagine. Filled with God, yes, filled with God, pardoned and cleansed and filled with God, filled with God, yes, filled with God, emptied of self and filled with God. Just a moment. What? Now, that's what God wants to do with you. Amen. You don't have to help Noah fill the ark, build the ark. Thank God. You don't have to make the loaves and fishes. But you do have to yield and let God fill you. Oh, Because glory. that's his purpose now. Filled with God, yes, filled with God. Pardon and cleansed, pardon and cleansed, and filled with God. Filled with God, yes, filled with God. Emptied of self, emptied of self, and filled 
with God. Hallelujah. Now say this. I am here for you. I am here for you. I am here for you. Fill me with yourself. For your, for your purpose. Hallelujah. I'd like you to put the chart of days back up again. Please. Now this is time. Which God cut out and measured out of eternity. Where are we? We're at the end of the sixth day. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus came. We are at the end of the sixth day. We're almost at the end of Adam's lease. There will be a seven-year Shemitah cycle. I won't teach you about that. At the beginning of which we will be caught away. And at the end of which um, we will leave the married supper of the lamb on a white horse. It's glorious. Our marvelous future. The future is as bright as God can make it. But this morning God talked to me about something else. Before time. That's called eternity past. And after time, that's eternity future. We really don't have a lot in the word about eternity future. But this morning, as the Lord was speaking to me about this, I remember a prophecy from Brother Kenneth e. Hag uh, No, no, it was Kenneth Copeland. A prophecy... Um, Praise God. There it is. Sometimes it shakes its little head at me. But it didn't this time. And I looked to see if I had it on my computer, and I do. And this prophecy was given some time ago. And uh, the Spirit of the Lord was talking about this great final move. Uh, my spirit, saith the Lord, I'm going from village to village, city to city, town to town, shore to shore, mountaintop to valley, Seeking out and recruiting an army. I'm looking for those that will join me in forming the most powerful spiritual armada in the history of this planet. These are the days of my vengeance, saith God. These are the days of my vengeance to vindicate the blood. And then there's quite a bit about this glorious army. Uh, one line I'm going to take out of it is, I will have a glorious church. That's the church here on this earth before Jesus comes filled with his glory. And the authority of hell will not prevail against it. Now, another part I'm, I'm just taking out. It's a very long prophecy. I am the great I am, saith the Lord. My day and my hour has come. When my day and my hour came to be baptized in water, no man could stop me. When my hour came to be born in a manger, manger, no devil could stop me. When my hour came, Herod and all of his troops could not stop what was happening in the earth. It's no different now. I have chosen this hour, I have chosen this generation to be the generation that shall stand in the great light and in great power. Oh, you have no concept of the victory that is in store for you. Hallelujah. Even the great things that they saw will only be child's play compared to the miraculous that shall occur in these last days and have even already begun in its light stages. Now, so that's what we're going to look for in this hour. But he gave us a glimpse of eternity future. Not much in the Bible about it. But this glimpse here from this prophecy has stayed with me through the years. We're talking about when time, when the seventh day has passed. For these, these days we're in, are the days of the greatest revelations of all. In the future, out in the distant ages that you know nothing of, I'll give you a glimpse of what it shall be like. Never again, never in any age in the future again will there be the likes of you.
speaking to the church, the body of Christ. You will walk the streets of the cities of the planets and the stars. I built the universes for you, and you'll travel it with me. And all of those that shall be born in the future and all of the years to come, folks, earth is going to be reinstated. There are going to be people here on the earth with longevity restored to them. They're going to be having babies. The Bible says a play with you know, lions and tigers and bears. The children. But that's not us. Because we've been caught up and given glorified bodies like unto his glorious body. So, and all of those that shall be born in the future and all of the years to come as natural men and natural women populate even the stars, they'll say to one another, there comes one of the kings. There comes one of the special ones. There comes the image of the master. Oh, that we had lived in that age. They are so special. They get the best of everything. Their father keeps them in his bosom. Oh, we have it blessed and we have it good. But it's because of them. They walk in the glory realm. They walk in the light realm. We have joy. They have ecstasy. Never, never will there be any more like you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are three groups of people on the earth. Old Testament, the nations, and the Jews. The New Testament, the New Covenant, any Jew, any Gentile, if they recognize that Jesus died for their sins, and they confess him as Lord, then he comes inside, but he makes you a brand new species. A brand new man. Never the likes of this species before, and never the likes of us again. Hallelujah. So here we are, and we're in a place in time. We're still in time here. And God's doing something in this time in which we live. And he wants you and me to cooperate with him in it. Hallelujah. So if you'll turn to the book of Ephesians. Hallelujah. And I'm going to kind of start at the end. I never have started here before. We'll see how it turns out. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, remember I told you that all of time, this time God measured out, it was divided into ages and dispensations. Different things are happening at different ages and different dispensations. But here's how God wants it, this time, to end up. So we're going to go to chapter 3, verse 9. Now, Paul's speaking of what he preaches, and he says that to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Remember I told you that I had this vision of the fall of man? And when man fell, I saw Satan saying, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? And he had man behind him. And I saw that God did not answer and I saw this door in God. God was just like a great big huge light. But there was a door with a knob on it. And it said top secret. And I saw because Satan thought he had divided man. And God had said man will have dominion over the works of my hands. So Satan thought he defeated God. God couldn't touch man. God couldn't. God couldn't. He, Satan knows sinful man would be burned up in, in God's clutch. The Lord told to me. He said, I want you to see the fall the way I see it. It is the natural man, the natural man of a fallen son. He'll reach for him and clasp him to his bosom. But had I done that with Adam, I would have consumed him, burned him up, and with him all mankind. And Satan would have defeated me because I said man will have dominion. 
So I saw when Satan said, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? With man cowering behind him, I saw that God didn't answer him. And I saw this door. Top secret. God had a plan. And he hid it in the best place you could hide it. In God. And none of the prophets of the Old Testament knew it. None of the writers of the four Gospels knew it. Nobody knew it till God revealed it to a man named Paul. And you can find out in Galatians chapter 1, if you add the years where he was when he went aside to here and he went to Africa, Arabia, 17 years he was away from the other apostles. And God revealed him. Revelation that Peter said, sometimes it's hard to, to understand what, what Paul got. But we do. Bless the Lord. So now we're in a time of revelation when it's coming more and more to us. What Paul got about the body of Christ. These who in eternity future will live in ecstasy. And that's you and that's me. And we're at a place in God's timetable. We're in that place just before Adam's lease runs out. And God has plans for us, which we must yield to. Now here, all this ages, he had a plan. He had that plan before. Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So he had a plan hidden in him. And the plan is going to culminate in this we're going to read right here. This is called... The purpose of the ages, the eternal purpose from the very first age to where we are right now, God has a purpose. It's called the eternal purpose. And this is it. Verse 9. Are you ready? Don't you want to know the eternal purpose? <laughs> And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent, this is it, this is the purpose of the ages, that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenlies, the rulers, the authorities in the heavenlies, those demonic spirits that are set up over the earth because Adam sold out to them. To the intent that now and to the principalities and powers in the heavenlies might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now the eternal purpose of the ages is that that demon, Satan, and all of his cohorts see God through the body of Christ. Woo! Thank you, Lord. It is not God's will that Satan run you around. It is God's will that you reign in life through one Jesus Christ right now. To the intent, verse 10, that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose. This is God's eternal purpose. Some translations read um, uh, the everlasting purpose, the purpose through the ages. This is God's eternal purpose. This is what he was getting to when he came down through Noah, when he came down through the prophets, when he came down through Jesus, when he came down through Paul, when he came down through Peter. He was getting to you. And this generation, and in this generation, he wants himself manifested to those demonic powers. And he wants to do it through who? You. 
the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Now, how is he uh, doing this? Well, we're going to back up here to the first chapter. No, second chapter. We, the body, are being builded into something. Chapter 2, verse 21. In whom all the building, fitly framed together, grows unto an holy temple in the Lord. In whom you also are builded together for, this is what you're for, an habitation of God. Through the Spirit. Wigglesworth saw it. Some have seen it. But we're all going to see it. We are here for him to fill us with himself. You are here for God to fill you. With himself. Say, I am here, I am here for, you for you to fill me, to fill me with, yourself. with yourself. Fill me, Lord. Fill me, Lord. That's what's going on. And in verse 22, in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. For this cause. We have a cause. This is our cause. Young people want a cause. It could be a spotted owl or whatever. But our cause is to be filled. I don't know. In America, they're saving the spotted owl. But our cause is this building. This habitation of God. And he goes on and speaks about our cause. He's building us a habitation for God. This is the eternal purpose that he will fill us with himself and we will manifest. When you get filled with God, it's not a bit hard for you to, to control demons. When you're filled with God, they'll run from you as if in terror. Now, we go on down with this cause. Verse 14. For this cause... I bow my knees. That means I pray. For this cause. For God to fill his church. Fill his body. Fill his temple with himself. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can pray this prayer. I used to pray this prayer every day and I'm taking it back up again. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant me, according to the strength to be strengthened, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in my inner man, in order that Christ may dwell in my heart by faith, I had a Baptist preacher once who had just been filled with the Holy Ghost, and he said, what do you think that means? Because they were already born again, these Ephesians. Well, it took me a lot of time to find it out. But it says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in your inner man. The Bible tells us that we are a spirit. That's the inner man. We have a soul, and we live in a body. Now, your inner man needs to be strengthened for something. For what? That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. Years ago, the Lord told Brother Copeland, translate that. What does that mean? The anointed one and his anointing. 
the anointed one and his anointing. There is something about you that needs to be strengthened in your inner man so that the fullness of the anointed one and his anointed won't blow you up. That you can operate in a power. And it depends. You can't do it with a little weak, undernourished spirit. It has to be with a strengthened spirit that you can have the fullness of the anointed one and his anointing dwell big in you. In order that the anointed one and his anointing may dwell in your heart by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in what? Love. L-O-V-E, love. That's the only way you're going to be able to have this power, stand this power, manifest God. You are going to have to submit to the law of love. In order that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints... What is the breadth and length and depth and height, you could say, of love? And to know the love of the anointed one, which passes knowledge, in order that what? You might be filled with all the fullness of What is God doing in my generation? What does God expect of you? He expects of you to be filled with God. We're his temple. Did you read in the Bible? 1 Corinthians 3.16, 1 Corinthians 6.19, 2 Corinthians 6.16. Know you not, you are the temple of God. You are not your own, you are bought with a price. God dwells in you. I think sometimes we don't appreciate the temple. God inside you. Exodus chapter 40. We'll turn to Exodus chapter 40. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Exodus is in here somewhere. Bless the Lord. Exodus chapter 24. We talk about the glory. I'll just read this one. This is when Moses was on a mount. And Moses went up into the mountain, a cloud covered the mount, and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. Ephesians 5.27 says we're going to be a glorious church. Fire, presence, power, glory. Is to indwell us and be seen on your very face. Now, Exodus 40. I just happened to see that, so I stopped there. Just about the glory. So God, when Moses was upon that mountain, and he told him about time and a six-day work week, and he told him about make a place for me to come down and be close to them. God had been separated from man. But he cleaned off a little spot down there on the earth. And he told him to build him a tabernacle so that the glory, just as much of God as they could stand, was there. Leviticus 1, verse 33, the last line, So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the glory abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Verse 38. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day and a fire on it by night 
in the sight of the children of Israel. God told Brother Hagin, this man I worked for, and maybe you know Kenneth E. Hagin, it would behoove you to look up all the scriptures on the glory. He didn't have a computer to find them all. He hung them up with a concordance, wrote them on a piece of paper. I would watch him. He'd be sitting on the platform, and I would see him jump like this. And in the back of his Bible cover, he had those scriptures. He'd get up. He'd just start reading them. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a cloud, like a fire. And he'd read then Exodus in the tabernacle. And he'd go over into the temple in Chronicles when the glory filled the place. Sometimes he'd get as far as, as Stephen, but not often. Because when God told him to do that, at some point, the glory of the Lord would come in like a wave in the back. And it would wave up. And it would bring all the people down the front. And it would do wonderful, marvelous things. I myself was preaching on the glory one time. And Shelly, a lady, has come to Prayer Mountain and moved there, who was in that meeting in Georgia. And I was preaching on the glory of the Lord. I didn't even do a good job. It was a bad job. <laughs> because they had given me a time limit. And I was just going like this. So I'm the glory of the Lord. And they said, if you don't finish on time, they're going to pull you off. And I was just, poor people. I look at their faces. They were just staring at me. I had everyone's attention because they never saw anything like this in their lives. <laughs> the Lord, I've been praying all day because they kept, this one woman wanted me to come there and bring what was called the faith message of that church. She wanted Brother Hagin. She couldn't get him. She wanted Brother Copeland. She couldn't get him. The preacher, the pastor, didn't want us either. But she was the biggest giver in the whole church. And so she, she begged him and begged him. And finally he said, okay, I'm going to England. And she can come and speak. It was a huge church, 6,000 members. Uh, she can come and speak at the Wednesday night prayer, uh, praise service. So they had, I don't know, a few hundred at that. And, but she has to quit. You have to give her. She can have 30 minutes. So I asked the Lord. What do I preach? I prayed all the day long. I prayed and prayed. You're going to preach on the glory. Now, the, when I preach the whole glory thing, it takes 90 minutes. I prayed all the day. Won't you change it? No, no, I won't change it. Just before we went out the door, she said, by the way, uh, they have uh, shortened your time. I think it was either 15 or 20 minutes. Um, a singer has come through off Broadway. And he just, uh, he's, he's touring the United States and he just got saved and I thought, well, perhaps, you know, I mean, sing, singing can be right, worship right. It wasn't right. He still had a little too much Broadway <laughs> and a little too little word. And he got up and he sang these songs that were tearjerkers and uh, told how God killed his mother and killed his aunt in order to get to him. Strange, uh huh? But that's what he thought. It was looking worse and worse. And then they hand it to me. And I started, well, in the first Genesis number one, Genesis number two, and the tohu babohu, and blah, 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 I'm going like this. And the guy that was the head of it was a well known politician in that state. He's the head of this service with the pastor gone, and he is going to yank you off the platform after 15 or 20, I can't remember which. I was wishing the floor would open up and swallow me. I looked over there and saw him, and there he was. I stopped. But then I looked up, and right over there, here came a wave. And it was a glory of the Lord. It's like a water, it's like a mist, but it acts like a, uh, an ocean wave. And it picked up everybody in that place and brought them to the front. Everybody! And I stood back here and watched it. Now, there was a woman right over there, and she said, I drove by here today. I've been running from God for 45 years, and my car just turned in here. Now, when I was praying that day, when I was praying that day, begging God to change the sermon, I said, oh, Lord, dear Father, angels, help me go out and get people, bring them to the meeting that don't know about the meeting. She said, I was driving down as a big highway, and my car just turned in here, and I haven't been able to move. I've got to get to God. This other guy, this was in Atlanta, Georgia. This other guy, young man, 
Me too. I'm driving here from Nashville. I didn't even know this was a church. I didn't know you had a service, but I've got to get to God. I'm just standing here amazed. And then the whole crowd just goes crazy. And the piano player starts dancing across the front. Well, a lot of people dance, you know. She was crippled. And she was scheduled for surgery that week. And she got up totally healed and danced across the front. When the church of God is filled with the glory of God, like the tabernacle, like the temple, the glory does the work. The glory wins people. The glory calls people. It's the best, God told me, it's the best evangelistic tool ever there was is the presence of God. You just have the presence of God in your church. You just have the presence of God in your life. And, and people will run to you. Shelly is, um, she's a really sweet person. And she's filled with God. And she really yields to him. And when she goes out, women especially women, I don't care where she is, they run to her and they start telling the whole life story. And Brother Hagin prophesied that. He said, you're going to be out there. Your face is going to shine with the glory of the Lord. And people are going to run up to you. They're going to fall at your feet. They're going to say, I'm convicted of my sin. And they're going to come to me. And so that's what he wants out of me. That's what he wants out of you. And that line in that song, we are here for you. We are here for you to fill us with your glory. This is what's happening now. This is what the devils will see and tremble at God. The tabernacle was filled. Second Chronicles chapter 5, turn there. Then in God's plan, you see God's plan moves along. He was in that tabernacle. Now he's going to go into a temple in the city, the place that he named. Second Chronicles chapter 5. You know the story. You know that David wanted to build it, but his hands had shed too much blood, so Solomon building it. And that same line is written. There was a line. Moses finished the work. Now look at this line, 2 Chronicles 5.1. Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. Hallelujah. It was the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. In verse 2, then Solomon assembled all the elders of Israel and the tribes and the chief of the fathers to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David. And it was the feast in the seventh month, Tabernacles, autumn for America. Uh, what do you have in October here? I don't know. But for Israel, it would have been autumn. You have a spring. So there they were, millions of them. Here's Mount Maria, where the temple is. Mountains are all around it. There's millions of people. They're all the feasts. All the priests are there. There's about 4,500 priests that serve in different orders, but they're all there for this day. Verse 11, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. The Levites, the singers, the names all of them, Asaph, Heman, Yedithan, with their sons, their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them 120 priests, sounding with trumpets. It came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one, unities apart, to make one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, and when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. 
when I studied Hebrew, I wanted to know what they said. And they actually said, Hallelujah. Ki tov, for he is good. Ki leolam, forever, chasdo. There's a word, chesed. It doesn't mean mercy. It means obligatory love because you're in covenant with someone. Don't have time to teach on that, but what a blessing. So they said, hallelujah. Ki tov, ki leolam, chasdo. And they sang it antiphonally. The Levite priest had a white cloth. This is truth. I didn't make it up. And he would sing it, the leader of the songs, Hallelujah. And all the people would say, Kitov, Ki Leolam Chasdo, Hallelujah. Kitov. Ki leolam chasdo. Hallelujah. Ki tov. Ki leolam chasdo. Hallelujah. Ki tov. Ki leolam chasdo. Hallelujah. Ki tov. Ki leolam chasdo. And when they reached one sound, then the house was filled with a cloud and all the priests, 4,500 priests, fell over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, Moses built the tabernacle. Solomon built the temple and finished the work. Now let's go back to Ephesians and let's see who's working on this house. Ephesians. Hallelujah. Chapter 2. Verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is building this house. The Holy Spirit is building this temple, which temple you are. And you are being builded for a house of God. You are being builded to be filled with the glory so that you are the glorious church. And the Holy Spirit is not going to be the first builder who fails. Sometimes it looks kind of, huh? Because why? Satan's so afraid of it. He's so afraid of us manifesting God. And so he comes with his favorite little tools. Division. I'll keep them divided. They can't be as one. I'll keep them divided. I'll plant this thought into their heads about that brother, that sister. So how do we cooperate with him? Ephesians chapter, this prayer. Remember this prayer. Remember this prayer. Remember this prayer. Chapter 3, for this cause, for this cause that he's building us together. I bow my knees, I pray unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant us according to the rich of his, uh, riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in our inner man, that the anointed one in his anointing may dwell in my heart by faith, that I, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love. The love, the love, the love, the love, the love of Christ, which passes knowledge in order that I might be filled with all the fullness of God. That this congregation may know the love. 
so that you might be filled with all the fullness of God and you walk out and all of Gosford sees people shining. And from the beaches, they run up to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To know the love which passes knowledge in order that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power working in us, unto him be glory where? In the church. By Christ Jesus. How long? Through all ages. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, even into eternity future, they'll be looking up and say, there goes one of the glorious ones. That's the work he's doing today. Now, you have to cooperate with him. I'm going to keep you just a little bit longer here, not a whole long time. But I learned how to walk in love. There's a how-to. There's a how to do it. I went to church all my life. Born on a church pew, you might say. And then I came across this handsome Cherokee. Voted the most handsome boy in our school, and I, I went after him. Sometimes girls have to go after him. And, and, I, and I got him. I caught him. That's how come I have these beautiful children. And they all have cards that say they're Cherokee in their pockets. And that means a lot in America. You get some perks for that. <laughs> and uh, so, but, you know, he, he didn't get born again until he was 16. And he got born again the same day his dad did. So he wasn't exactly raised in that, you know. So I figured he's pretty lucky to have me teach him everything. You should tithe. What? <laughs> Give 10% of my hard-earned money to away? Yes. And if he didn't cry, tithe, I cried. <laughs> I did. He'd say, here come the waterworks. <laughs> he was a wonderful man, a really good man. He, he loved family and children and spent time with his children he told me he'd like to have a dozen. We quit at four. But he loved him so. And when he was getting ready to leave, and that's a long story, we won't tell you. He actually left by choice because he was sick and God gave him a choice. But anyway, he told Shelley, he said, I'm just going to regard this as a vacation. But the part that I don't like is it's the first time I've ever gone anywhere. I couldn't take you kids with me. Good man, really good man. And we, we got married young. We had babies fast. I'm glad we did, because then they grew up, and they helped me now, and we had 30 years together. He died young, only 49. And, uh, but when he was young, and Shelly, she's only like 14 months older than her little brother. And then there was a time when I had children, four children under the age of five and four months. So uh, two of them were in diapers at that same time. I remember he would come home, and we didn't have automatic. We were living in an apartment, and he had to go out and do the laundry and bring in the diapers, and we folded them, and he'd give me his paycheck, and he was just a good man. But he had flaws, and one of them was he never remembered my birthday. <laughs> and uh, he remembered always Valentine's Day. It was well advertised. But birthday, anniversary, he didn't remember. And I would know that he was going to forget it. So I would start a few days early, building up resentment. He's not going to remember. He's not going to remember. He's not going to remember. So it would come my birthday, and he worked in the same city where we lived, and get up for breakfast, and I'd slam down the breakfast. He came in at noon, I'd be in the bedroom crying. I wanted him to come in there and say, darling, you know, but he didn't. He's a Cherokee, Indian. They're very stoic. In the evening, he'd come in, no supper. 
He'd come in the bedroom. I remember this happening very plainly one time. My eyes are red. I would calculate how many days it was till Sunday when I went to church because I didn't want my eyes swollen. <laughs> you talk about manipulative, which is bad. And I said, he'd say, what is wrong with you? Is it your birthday or something? And my birthday is December 6th, same day as Brother Copeland's. He'd say, well, I thought it was December the 8th. But he said that every year, so I don't know. Something was wrong with that. <laughs> and that is just kind of, we went along. And then I got filled with the Holy Ghost. And then I came to work for Brother Hagen. And I'm his editor of publication. I'm supposed to take what he teaches and put it into books. Those Brother Hagen books you got, I did them. So... Brother Hagin's going to have, because Brother Hagin thought the, most, the last sermon I ever heard him preach was, what did you do with love? You're going to have to answer for it. You were given it. You're going to have to answer. What would you do with it? So he said, I'm going to do a seminar on love, and we're going to make a book. Okay. I go to the seminar. I got my little steno pad. He says, here's how you walk in love. Number one, you have to be born again. Because this is divine love. It's not natural human love. Natural human love is selfish. Very selfish. It can turn to a divorce court after it's sworn forever. But he said, this is divine love. And you only can have it if you're born again. But the moment you're born again, you get it. The moment you're born again, Romans 5.5 5, this was the steps. He had steps. Number one step, be born again. Number two step, no Romans 5.5. 5. Romans 5.5 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad in your spirit by the Holy Ghost. The minute you got born again, how many of you were born again? How many of you were under five years old? How many of you were under 10 years old? How many of you were under 20 years old? How many of you were 40 or over? That moment, whatever age you were, whatever age you were, it says in Thessalonians that we are a spirit. I'm a spirit. You can't see me. This is the house I live in. I'm a spirit. I live inside this house. I look out these windows. But in my spirit, in my heart, I have a soul, mind, will, and emotions. I live in a body. But if I suddenly departed and went to heaven, my body would go down here, just the house. But in my heart, in my spirit, I was seven when I got born again. When I'm born again, right then the old man dies. You become a brand new creation. And in your spirit comes the love of God. The God kind of love. And then that love is to grow in you, dominate you, and fit you so that you can be filled with the power of God. Filled with God. Isn't that what it said in Ephesians? That you can know the love so that you can be filled with God. Conversely, if you don't walk in love, forget being filled with God. Forget power. Forget your faith working. Faith works by love. Most people don't have faith problems if they're believers. They have love problems. Just a little something against somebody. A little spit, a little spat. So, the love of God, step two, no Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God is shed abroad in my heart. Number three. Now, this was his number three step way back when I was hearing this in 1970. Buy an Amplified Bible. And in that amplified Bible, see how love behaves. We have only one law, the law of love. And here's how it behaves. Here's how it acts. So I copied it in the back of my King James Bible. I'm going to read it to you. Now, Brother Hagin always said this, one step out of love is a step into sin. 
So how many people are living in sin? Born again. But don't qualify for the power. So here's love. Here's how. Now he said, now you take a little thermometer of yourself. You take a, you take a little gauge of yourself, whether you're walking in love. So here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very smug. I've been born again since I'm seven. I'm a really nice person. That's all my head is going, you know. I never miss church. I tithe. Well, so we start down the road. So you, 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 you give yourself a test right now. The Bible says judge yourself. Okay. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Is that you? you do you endure long? Are you patient and kind? Brother Hagin, I remember him saying it that day. A lot of people endure long, but they're not patient and kind about it. They want everybody to know. You don't know how long I've been putting up with that old geezer. <laughs> Nobody takes care of mama but me. I'm the only brother and sister that takes care of mama. You know. Love never is envious, nor boils over with jealousy. Oh, what a killer that is. I remember we were having a meeting, and a young man, preacher Mark Brzee, very good-looking young man, he had a beautiful wife, has still a beautiful wife. And this woman came up in the meeting. She said, I want you to pray for me. My husband's, my husband's not born again. I wanted to be born again, but I won't let him come to these meetings. What? You won't let him come to the meetings? No. I don't want him to look at her, that girl she sings every night. She's that jealous. So... Jealousy is a real, real, real bad thing. If you're that insanely jealous, you're not walking in love. Love is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. You know, I, I, I probably was a little boastful and vainglorious, but I didn't recognize it. And I knew that I certainly wasn't jealous. I never have been jealous. I'm patting me on the back. Hey, I'm doing really good. One, two, three, four, really good. Love is not conceited, arrogant, or inflated with pride. I really was, but I didn't recognize it. Love is not rude, unmannerly, does not act unbecomingly. I wasn't rude. I really wasn't. Love does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it's not self-seeking. I really didn't do that either. Uh-oh. Brother Hagin said, you're going to come to one of these, and it's going to be your challenge. And he said, now this next one here, it's a real love thermometer. Love is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. What? Something's wrong with being touchy? My Nazarene grandmother is very touchy. She and all of her sisters, they write letters to each other. Well, I haven't heard from you in a long time, but I still love you. I don't know if you love me, but I love you. <laughs> touchy. What? Goes home from church, griping and complaining about the pastor. Well, I don't know. Sister so-and-so didn't even speak to me. I don't know who she thinks she is. What more? And what about he forgot my birthday? Never, never does remember my birthday. And what about that one time he's supposed to pick me up from work, but he was playing a baseball game? You talk about books. I kept good books. I can remember one time he did a certain thing, and I said, Kent, you did this three years ago. I remember. <laughs> so do you keep good books? Love is not touchy or fretful. Do you fret? Are resentful, takes no account of the evil done to it. I think we would transform into power in one day if just the body of Christ would take no note of evil done to it. Just one day. Not notice suffered wrongs. Now don't you go home today and notice any suffered wrongs. Just for one day. Just do it one day. So Brother Hagin, I said, whoa, that's me. I recognize myself. I'm touchy. Here comes the waterworks. 
So he said, if you have trouble with something, you get a three by five card and you write that verse on it. And you meditate that verse and you say that verse. And especially when you're tempted, you say that verse because you, the love of God is in there. It might be buried, like the guy buried uh, the talent in a napkin. But it's there. It's in you. You just have to call it up. And the way you call it up is by faith. You believe it, and you say it with your mouth. I have the love of God in me. I'm not touchy or fretful or resentful. I pay no attention to a suffered wrong. And so I put it on cards. I put it. Typed it up and put it on cards. At work, I put it on my little steno thing that pulled out because there was one guy at work that gave me lots of trouble. And I'd, he'd come in, and I'd look at that. I'd pull it out. Oh, that's not touch you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. And then there was Kent and my kitchen. Now, Kent's a good man, a real sweet man, a loving man. We never considered divorce. He didn't ever spend a night on the couch. But, you know, he had a little few flaws, like he didn't remember my birthday and things like this. So I took these cards, and I typed them up, and I put them every place. I put them in my kitchen cabinets. My children can remember them being there. I taped them inside the the, the cabinet door because the kitchen was a place of attack. We had a great big country kitchen. And for instance, here's an instance. One night, I was going to go teach in a Bible school, Billy Joe Doherty's Bible school. And, uh, no, this was another night. This was another night. This is the soup night. And he comes in the back door, and it's cold, you know, the first cold weather. And what, what have you got tonight? Well, I got uh, soup, vegetable soup. So uh, I always tried to get him not to lift lids and eat out of the pots, but he never did stop it. And he went over, and he got him a spoon. He he's, Hmm, what'd you put in this soup anyway? I go to the cabinet, open the door. Then I told him what I put in the soup. Counterattack. I wish she'd call mom and see what she puts in her soup. doesn't know that he's irritated me. He's completely oblivious to any of this going on in me. But I'm making a battle. I'm battling for that love to dominate me. So another night is cold. We call him a norther when the first, of course, you're warm in the north and cold in the south, but we're opposite. So we say a norther blew in, and it was the first blue norther. Why we call him blue, I don't know, but we call him that. And it blew in that day, and I made chili. Now, Kent knows that I make the best chili, even better than his mother. <laughs> and uh, that night, I'm going to go teach in Billy Joe uh, Doherty's Bible school. So I've been home all day preparing, and I made cornbread. Do you know what is cornbread? Okay, in the South, we, we make great cornbread. It does not taste like cake. If it tastes like cake, it's not cornbread. It tastes like cornbread. <laughs> and you have these black iron skillets. And you, you put in the fat in the skillet. And you put the skillet in the oven for 10 minutes at least till it's really hot. And then you pour the batter in there. And then the cornbread comes out with this dark black crust. You know what that is? Anybody ever been blessed to eat it? Oh, it's great. It's just marvelous. Well, I made cornbread. And I had chili. Kent comes in the back door. What you got? Chili. Oh, great. Where are the crackers? Honey, you don't need crackers. I made cornbread. Well, I don't know. I just don't feel like cornbread. (laughs) How could anybody not feel like hot cornbread with butter? Go ahead. (laughs) No account to the evil done to it. Now, every time I did that, that love would come up. But this night, that love came up like fire. I felt it. It boiled up in me. It came in my spirit. It went out my arms. It went out my eyes. Kent's over by the stove with the pot lid up. (laughs) 
And this love, this divine love came over me. And I, nothing could satisfy me on earth but to get that man corn, uh, crackers. <laughs> I had to get him crackers. <laughs> now, normally, if I, did, if I walk in the flesh, I'm going to say, you got a brand new pickup out there. you got two legs. You can go down and get you some crackers. No, but I didn't. I went and looked at that, and it called up the love. It called it up. And, and I, I cannot only tell you, I felt it. It came over my whole being. It engulfed me. And if I didn't get him crackers, I would die. I said, darling, I will get you crackers. <laughs> and I start out the back door. And he says, oh, by the way, honey, we're out of coffee. <laughs> he doesn't know anything going on. Yes. So I drive down our little town to this grocery store, and they used to have on what you call butcher paper, they would have what they call loss leaders. There's going to be an item they sell at a loss just to get you in the store. And they had two items on that butcher paper, crackers and coffee. I took it as a sign from heaven that I passed the test. Kent and I had been married about, we had like 15 years left. I didn't know that. My Jesus, I didn't know it. I loved him every day of those 15 years. But I can't say that I walked with love dominating me until the last 15 years. Changed everything. Changed everything. Before I really got the victory over that, I was driving home one day from work. And, then brother, and I, I told you that I used to work for Anaconda Wire and Cable. And we, we sold electrical cable, really powerful stuff. And it had, you know, protection on it, insulation. And we would build it up from the inside out. And uh, the Lord told me, driving home, he said, Billy, there's not an angel that follows you around. And with a valve, when you're rock acting real nice and walking in love, that says, power up. And then when you blast off, it can't power down, unless you kill him, you know. He said, love is the insulation. The power of God. You cannot imagine what it will do. It will heal blind eyes. It will make the sick, it will make the sick well. It will, it will stop storms. It will, it will do marvelous things. But it cannot be put into the hands of a spiritual baby that would not walk in love. It has to be in the hands of someone who's strengthened with might in their inner man so that the anointed one and his anointing can operate from there and you can be filled with all the fullness of God. So what does God want you to do? He wants you to learn how to walk in love so that he can fill you with his fullness. His glory can be seen. And we're going to talk more about how you manifest that to the devil and demons tonight.